Hello, Fallout reference. Ah, I really should have planned something for this intro. Greetings, travellers of the wasteland and Magic the Gathering players and mutants and ghouls, brotherhood guys, uh, enclave people, synths, robots, and death claws. <laughs> what? Welcome back to Silvermere, the channel where I am. It's finally here, the Fallout Times Magic the Gathering set or commander decks that also come in boosters is out i think no it's not actually it's out at some point in march but it's it's all all the spoilers are there as you already know uh, at some point in the last few years magic set stopped being only about magic the gathering and started being about other stuff as well and now each year a few sets are released under the universes beyond imprint or label or whatever it is depicting worlds outside of the magic canon and all of these products so far have been really really good amongst the best that wizards releases in a given year even while their own universe falls to ruin they've done a good job representing other peoples and so when we finally got around to a property that i really care about like fallout um i was over the moon and then when the spoilers for the cards started to come out my excitement got dampened a little bit and now that the set's here I'm kind of annoyed. <laughs> I'm pretty disappointed. The title of this video may seem a bit hyperbolic, but I do genuinely believe this is true. Whilst my perception of the set is positive on the whole, there were so many little issues and missteps across the whole thing that didn't really show up in the other Universes Beyond products, at least to my knowledge. So I wanted to make a quick, we'll see how quick, but a quick-ish video just going through all my thoughts about this new Fallout set and how I ultimately think it's a bit underwhelming. But there is a lot of good stuff to like as well. So I've organized everything, generally going from positive to negative. We'll talk about all the stuff that's good or okay, and then I've saved all of the really annoying, irritating stuff that pissed me off to the end of the video. So before we begin, I guess I'll give you my Fallout credentials, because that's probably what half of you are waiting for right now, before deciding whether or not to disregard my opinion entirely. Fair enough. I am a basic bitch Fallout fan. Fine. Whatever. Fuck you. So, I played three, and New Vegas, and four. And each of them I've played a fair few times each, but I haven't played the original first two games. Um... And then there's a bunch of other smaller minor games I haven't played. And then, is there, or is it just Brotherhood of Steel? I can't, whatever. And I haven't played 76 because it looked god awful on its release and then had like a year of hilariously bad news stories associated with it. And it just looked bad. And apparently it's a lot better now, but I, I don't have any desire to play it. And also when they first announced 76, I was just like, this is a bad idea. I don't, I don't care about that. Like, they're like, guys, we've made a Fallout game that's set before all the cool stuff from Fallout came about. Except, purely for the bombs going off. So, no, well, that sounds bad. So anyway, yes, three, four, and New Vegas are the ones I've played, and I've played them a fair bit, and I like all those games. They all have different issues and things. Obviously, New Vegas, I know it's the, the basic bitch opinion again, but New Vegas is the best one by a country mile. That said, even though my knowledge of the Fallout games is limited only to the Bethesda-associated 3D ones, I have seen <laughs> Noah Caldwell Gervais's exhaustive review of the franchise, so I have some idea of the earlier games and the, uh, whatever, the, the, all the other ones. Oh, I played Fallout Shelter a little bit, like a million years ago. I remember doing a glitch that let you get cool loot. I think that game's also changed quite a lot since I last saw it, so. But you know, we like Fall I like Fallout. I like some of the characters, I love the, the RPG mechanics of New Vegas particularly. Um, I love the feeling of the wasteland in any of the games, just wandering around that type of environment, and the, particularly the way it's presented in Fallout, is just a joy, regardless the, of even in the games where the RPG elements aren't particularly good. And I think, I think that's the most important thing about Fallout is that that feeling of this, uh, at least from again from a perspective of someone who hasn't played the originals. Fair enough. Um, the most important thing about Fallout is that that um, Americana inspired um, post apocalypse feeling, the clash between the horrific reality of the wasteland and the um, optimistic uh, imagery of the American ideal. It's parodying, I think. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the game is parodying, I mean. So let's begin looking at cards and how well I feel they represented the flavour of this franchise that I love. Fuck you, I don't care. I'm saying I love it. I'm calling myself a Fallout fan. I don't care if you play more than me, fuck off. The thing I'm judging these cards most on is how well I feel they represented the the Fallout lore and world and characters that they're trying to. That's the thing that I care most about. And given that Universes Beyond is about adapting IPs from outside of Magic and wants to hopefully draw in some new people from outside too, I think that's the most important part of any Universes Beyond product and what I'm evaluating this set on. 
So let's start with some legendary creatures. Some of the named characters of Fallout, eh? Moira Brown, a uh, really good card design. Let's type her into here. Thank God the Scryfall still has the letters embedded in the cards so you can, like, control F them. It's really useful. Thanks, Scryfall. She was a quest giver and you helped her complete her Wasteland Survival Guide, which could be better or worse depending on how much you decided to actually help her with research or just lie about it. Maybe this wasn't as sexy as I thought it was originally. Well, regardless, um, this Moira Brown makes the Wasteland Survival Guide, which is a equipment token which gives equipped creature plus one plus one for each quest counter among permanents you control. And whenever you attack, put a quest counter on target non-land permanent you control. Doing a really good job of representing both the research in the accumulation of quest counters and how that research translates into survivability for one of your creatures. So yeah, good. Nice translation. Uh, Mora was definitely one of the more likable characters in Fallout 3, just being cheery and enjoyable even after you blew up her home, if you did. Three Dog, the DJ that you would hear over the radio all the time in Fallout 3. And given your exposure to him, probably the best character in the game just through providing personality whilst you're wandering around the wastes in a game that is severely lacking for personality overall. His flavor text is one of the, I can immediately hear it in his voice, it's one of the things you hear him say a lot when you're playing a game for many hours that has repeated dialogue. Initially, I didn't, this didn't super gel with me, but the more I read this card, the more I think this is actually like a perfect example of, a, of just representing a DJ on the whole. Whenever you attack, you may pay two and sacrifice an aura attached to three dog, Galaxy News DJ. When you sacrifice an aura this way, for each other attacking creature you control, create a token that's a copy of that aura attached to that creature. So he's sacrificing the aura and broadcasting it out to all of your creatures, um, which is just excellent flavor for the, the broadcasting of ideas. And initially I thought like maybe the auras thing and the sacrificing it was a bit rubbish, but... Um, firstly, you can't recycle old news stories on the news. You've got to feed your listeners new stuff, so that's why he's going to sacrifice the thing. And secondly, it speaks to Three Dog's influence over the wasteland, that it's auras that he's giving people and not temporary effects, something that's lasting. Curie was also done well. A companion from Fallout 4, and Fallout 4, as much as I wasn't a huge fan of the story overall, it had... infinitely better characters than Fallout 3, you've got to say that. So a lot of the companions were actually worth hanging around and uh, completing their side quests, etc. Because it was rewarding in some way. Like Curie, who was a, whatever the female equivalent of a Mr. Handy is. And she was a robot scientist who wanted to become human, ultimately. So you found her like a synth body and stuck her in that body. And, you know, she wandered around as a human, kind of. So I feel like this card does an excellent job of representing all those facets of the character. Wherein, um, whenever Curie Emergent Intelligence steals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its power. Kind of equal to his base power, sorry, representing um, the scientific aspect of Curie, who is always on the hunt for new data and understanding of the world from her scientific lens. And she also has uh, pay one and blue, exile another non-token artifact creature you control. Curie becomes a copy of the exiled creature, except it has, whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its base power. So the ability perfectly allows Curie to take on this new form and become human, much like in the game or whatever else you want. And also, I, I really like how she doesn't retain that ability. She can only do it the once, again, much like in the game. Secondly, I really like how she retains her initial ability, both pointing at the fact that she's purely all about the research, she's gonna keep drawing cards as she continues to uh, expand her understanding of the world, but also the fact that in a new form she can now draw more cards, complete more research, also speaks to her desire in the first place to want to change. As in the game, she wanted to become human so as to have a better understanding of the world and to expand her ability to research. So excellent, really good translation of the character. Rex, a robot dog that you could pick up in New Vegas. Um, and you could go around and collect the other, the brains of other dogs and jam them in Rex to give him different buffs. And as you can see, Rex allows you to uh, exile creature cards from graveyards with a brain counter on them. And he gains all the activated abilities of all cards with a brain counter on them. So yeah, excellent. Good translation of Rex. Very nice. Preston is a similar deal. He was the most irritating companion in Fallout 4. He was constantly calling you over the radio, etc. to tell you settlements are being invaded or they need your help or there's a new settlement. Just settlement, settlement, settlement. So every third word Preston said was settlement. And so it's perfectly on flavor then that he... um makes you settlements. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a green aura enchantment token named settlement attached to up to one target land you control. It has enchant land and enchanted land has tap, add one mana of any color. When pressing Garvey Minutemen attacks, untap each enchanted permanent you control. So yeah, he puts settlements on your lands, which is great. It kind of makes it seem like he's doing the work when that was definitely me establishing all those settlements, but fine, if anyone's gonna be associated with settlements, it makes sense that it's 
Preston. I wish the settlement token was a little better. It just looks like, uh, oh god, all the, all the different protagonists of Fallout games have different, slightly different names. Whatever, the sole survivor, I want to say, from Fallout 4, it just looks like them wandering on Sanctuary Hills, which is a settlement, but this hasn't been changed in any way. It just looks like them re- returning to Sanctuary Hills for the first time. Like, why aren't these more established with little guys and stuff and the things you can build in the settlement builder? It just, why? Why? Wouldn't it make more sense to actually show a settlement on the settlement token instead of just the sole survivor's ass? Veronica was a companion from New Vegas, um, who came from a sort of particularly sheltered and cloistered arm of the Brotherhood of Steel, who are a post-apocalyptic group who are concerned with cataloging and maintaining and taking away all the dangerous tech of the past from the idiots of the now. Uh, one thing I do like about Veronica is uh, whenever Veronica Dissident Scribe attacks, you may discard a card, and if you do, you draw a card. Which is cool because um, Veronica's questline and gradually hanging out with you had her sort of questioning the old ways of her Brotherhood allies, whose opinions- oh, it's too fucking hot! Ugh. I have no idea what's going on with my hair. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's the blast back look from the 3D ones. Having her discard and draw cards like that works really well for a character whose um, opinion on her cloistered past kind of changes uh, across the game traveling with the player. Basically, it's very simple, but it does a good job. And she also makes junk, if you like junk. Um, Strong I mostly bring up for the excellent art by Jason Rainville. Strong was a super mutant who had read, or someone had read him Macbeth, I think, who he called Macbeth as two separate words, and he was obsessed with finding the milk of human kindness, um, as he believed it would make super mutants stronger than everything, or humans. So in Jason Rainville's excellent piece, he's got the milk to the back of Strong referencing this Milk of Human Kindness thing uh, whilst he holds up a skull in a Hamlet referencing moment um, and he's got the name Brutish Thespian which I'm not a huge fan of because Thespian means you're like an actor which Strong isn't at all he's just misinterpreting elements of Macbeth and trying to apply them to reality regardless the piece by Jason Rainville which apparently he uh, posed in Fallout 4, which I really like, is fantastic. Nick Valentine's probably my favorite Bethesda character from any Bethesda game. To a town that's terrified of robot synths that look like people, Nick is the most trustworthy synth by virtue of obviously being a synth and being incredibly charming. I told him I was rigged to explode and started going beep, beep, beep. Hardest part of that rescue was keeping from laughing as they climbed over each other to get away. He's just great. Detective Android guy improves every mission you bring him along to. He can't be blocked except by artifact creatures, which is a little... I think it should maybe be the other way around. Maybe it's like only... Um, I'm not sure actually. It's interesting that he can't be blocked by uh, except by artifact creatures, because it's um, humans that Nick has an affinity for, not other robots and synths and things. He hangs out with people. He likes to help people. Nick is people for all intents and purposes, not a, not a robot. But whenever uh, him or another artifact you control dies, you can investigate, which is, feels very on theme for a detective. And actually, the more I look at it, the less I like it. Why is Nick only investigating the deaths of artifacts? Like his other ability, it should be the other way around. This one definitely should be. He's a detective for a town full of humans. Piper, again, I don't have much to say about her. She is another character from Fallout 4 that was pretty good for Bethesda characters. She investigates when a new deal combat damage, which again feels a bit like a reporter, so cool. Butch is so dumb that I like it. Tunnel snakes rule! Yeah, he, Butch and the Tunnel Snakes are the best part of the worst part of Fallout 3, um, being the intro, when you're stuck in the vault at the beginning. They're a gang of bullies. Butch bullies you in the beginning of the game, and then you help him his mum out because she's being attacked by rad roaches. Regardless, they call themselves the Tunnel Snakes. They say Tunnel Snakes rule a lot, and uh, Tunnel Snakes rule the ability says, whenever Butch, Deloria, Tunnel Snake attacks, it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn for each other rogue and or snake you control, which is so fucking stupid that I love it. Fair play. Um, and also you know that if the Tunnel Snakes had had a snake as their pet mascot, they would have been obsessed with it and you would have seen it all the time, so um, excellent. There's a lot of not notable but fine characters. McCready, the Lamplight Mayor, he's a kid who you can't shoot and um, runs the town full of kids. He shows up later as a companion in Fallout 4, so he has affinity for uh, creatures with power 2 or less, which is quite good, and he doesn't like creatures with power 4 or greater because only kids are allowed in Lamplight and not adults. Get out! Yeah, and it's a, a section of the game. You can't kill children in the game. Not that I ever would, of course, but um, they really test your desire to not kill children in Little Lamplight, where you just get... You meet a huge roadblock to the story, and that roadblock involves a bunch of incredibly annoying children 
Hoomst are invulnerable, so enjoy. Who else is not particularly knowable, but good, but fine? Yeah, Liberty Prime, big robot, does big robot stuff. Cass, um, vengeful ranger, maybe ex-ranger, I can't remember, from New Vegas, who does stuff to do with when creatures die, so that makes sense for being vengeful. Oh, it was her caravan that got killed, wasn't it? Kellogg is the man who steals your baby at the beginning of Fallout 4, and I... <laughs> A not a particularly interesting character, even though the game spends a lot of time thinking about him. But I do like that he has the ability to sacrifice five treasures, gain control of target creature for as long as you control Kellogg. So you just, you just gotta pay Kellogg and he'll nick a baby for you, which is exactly how it worked in the game. So, cool. Sierra. Oh, right, the Nuka-Cola girl. Yeah, she was in two of the games. She likes Nuka-Cola. There wasn't much else about her. I like the art here, though, because... She's super into that nuclear quantum. Codsworth, uh, he does stuff to like help commanders, etc. He does stuff with equipment and auras. Um, yeah, not notable good art, just here. Okay, Brawler girl from Fallout 4, Irish, punches stuff, has abilities kind of to do with beating your opponent in a duel or a cage match, maybe? So I suppose that's okay. Uh, Colonel Autumn, um, the main antagonist? Maybe of Fallout 3? Is there an antagonist of Fallout 3? Is it... Oh, why didn't they put President Eden? I mean, it's occurred to me, you could put President Eden in here. He's like, not particularly, not super excited, but way more interesting than Colonel Autumn. Colonel Autumn was the main point of contact that you had with the evil Enclave in Fallout 3, who were basically the remnants of the US government and, and the bad guys in Fallout 3. He was working for a big computer that was the president, though, um, and is definitely, like, more interesting than Colonel Autumn, so I'm not sure why he's here instead of the other guy. He does stuff with exploiting creatures, I suppose that works? Not, yeah, I guess. It's not particularly exciting, it's just, like, a villain, so he gave him exploit as an ability. Ganon, one of the companions from New Vegas, even, um, lots more likable than many of the other characters, I mean, in this collection of cards because he's from New Vegas, so he's actually a good character. In New Vegas, through him, you could reunite a group of old soldiers from the Enclave I just mentioned. So I like that he, in the ability here that he has referencing the name of that quest, he uh, lets you cast artifact or human spells from your graveyard, which is kind of cool because it's referencing sort of the retired nature of the dudes he's gathering for you in the game. Good. Hancock, the mayor of Good Neighbor in Fallout 4. I really like the art here, again. And just Hancock has quite a cool design. Each other creature you control that's a zombie or mutant gets plus X plus X, where X is the number of counts on Hancock Ghoulish Mare. Good neighbor, the town that he's the mayor over is like the rough and tumble uh, place for the rejects of Diamond City to hang out. I kind of like that he has an ability that, you know, he sort of becomes a lord for some of your more rejected creature types, but maybe if you'd squeezed in a few more there, that would have worked better to give him this uh, residing over the rejected masses feeling a bit better. But it's not terrible. Mr. House, I'm in two minds about. Love the art. I think it's fantastic. Mr. House is one of the major factions, all on his lonesome, in New Vegas, who controls the uh, New Vegas Strip through a bunch of robot Securitrons. And Mr. House also has three crime families controlling the street for him, but he's, he's basically like Henry Ford, but in the Fallout universe, and with robotics as opposed to cars. You can see what he really looks like in the body that's reflected in the screen here. Um, and he keeps himself preserved in a machine that allows him to live X hundred years past his cell by day. Uh, whilst he projects this image of his younger self on the screen that you talk to for the majority of the game. He's, he's, a, he's a great character in the game, one of the best. I love that he's a human and also an artifact creature, and I love uh, the art is displaying the two modes of, the two different forms of Robert House that we speak to, basically, which is very cool. Whenever you roll a 4 or higher, create a 3-3 colorless robot artifact creature token. If you rolled 6 or higher, instead create that token and a treasure token. And then you can pay 4 and roll a 6-sided die plus an additional 6-sided die for each mana from treasure spent to activate this ability. I like Mr. House as a card in isolation a lot to be honest, and the rolling, uh, he makes the 3-3 three, three Securitron tokens and they have the right art, which is fantastic, which is, again, his whole deal. And secondly, I like that he's rolling dice and it feels like it's representing the six couriers that had to, I can't remember the exact <laughs> plot of New Vegas, I'm sorry, it's been a while. The six couriers, five of which were carrying um, fake platinum chips, which is the final bit of 
computer-y stuff that Mr. House needs to put in his real good mega Securitrons, that are the best ones yet, and are going to allow him to gain complete control over uh, New Vegas, essentially. The chip was actually upgrading his operating system, so it was more of a complete upgrade to House's systems, not just the Securitrons. House developed the chip before the bombs dropped, but lost it when they did, and finally uncovering its location centuries later, he arranged for it to be returned to him via courier whilst also arranging five decoy couriers. In New Vegas, you play as Courier 6, carrying the real chip. I'm assuming that the rolling the six dice, six dice uh, here is sort of referencing that. As well as his casino strip-owning nature. Which is very cool, very flavorful. The only thing is, if you go to build this deck as with Mr. House as your commander, to synergize with the dice rolling, you're going to end up roll, running a bunch of D&D cards, which, like... That's fine. It just doesn't feel very Fallouty. I'd rather build him as like robot tribal or something like that, which I guess you can, but yeah. Caesar is really good. Caesar was one of the major faction leaders in New Vegas. He was basically just a guy that had read about how the Romans conquered places and figured he'd give that a go and just be the Romans. And it was going pretty well for him as his legion tore across the Mojave Wasteland, enacting a brutal regime. I really like Caesar's uh, flavor in that he lets you sacrifice creatures and does a bunch of other abilities that feel very Caesar-y. Dealing damage equal to the number of creature tokens you control feels apt as just Caesar's Legion is amassing across the river and it's like this this big growing problem in New Vegas. I love the art by uh, Alexander Goering as well. Um, is it Goering? Goering? I'm going to say Goering because you don't want to be called Goering by accident. And that he's, he's mid uh, decision on whether you will uh, live or die at the end of this gladiatorial match, which is cool. The only thing that annoys me is the guys behind him, which are perfectly painted to look like Caesar's Legion uh, soldiers, I can't remember exactly which ones. But regardless, what they aren't is the Praetorian Guards, which is the dudes that should be flanking Caesar while he's in his chair. And it's just, they're, they're the specific guards that don't use weapons. They're supposed to be unarmed, even though they are using power fists. And they usually have mohawks. And it's just a bit of an annoying little detail, which you just, it's just kind of wrong. It's fine, but like, those aren't the guards that flank Caesar when he's in his camp. Boone, I'm not sure where to put in this video, whether it should be here or in the bad bit. He was a sniper companion you could pick up in New Vegas, and he fucking hated Caesar and the Legion for kidnapping his wife. And the card does kind of snipe enemy creatures. And your opponent can choose to take the damage, which feels a little bit like a choice the player could make during Boone's revenge quest to frame one of his town's residents for selling out his wife. Or it could be referencing a hard choice Boone had to make in the past. But it's very strange that it's your opponent making the choice here. I do like that he has lifelink as benefiting from the damage he deals speaks to his desire for revenge. But his second ability doesn't evoke the quest it's named after very well. And also, they put Boone in the bloody Caesar deck! This is how I saw the card spoiled. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone in the Wasteland hates Caesar more than Boone. Let's get one thing straight. I see any crimson, I'm taking a shot. You don't like that, you're on your own. And having him in the Caesar Helms deck, literally called Hail Caesar, feels horrible. If you have that deck, for his sake, please take Boone out of it. It's the last place he'd want to be. Oh, uh, yes, man. Ah, uh, I think I've soured. When I first, when this card was first spoiled, I quite liked it, and I think I've soured over time with with it. Yeah, so Yes Man was one of Mr. House's Securitrons that seemed to contain, um, like a... a copy of House's central computer, his mainframe, whatever it was. Regardless, Benny, another character who hasn't got a card in the set and was played by Matthew Perry, rest in peace, was using Yes Man to circumvent Mr. House's plan. So Mr. House planned to upgrade his robots and use these new upgraded robots to take control of Hoover Dam and, um, the New Vegas Strip more thoroughly and just be the ruler of the region in a, in a more complete sense than he already was. Benny, one of the members of the crime families that operated underneath Mr. House, was uh, trying to use Yes Man, this this robot, to circumvent Mr. House by uh, basically just taking Mr. House out of his plan and putting Benny in place. Now, Benny is the ruler of New Vegas through this army of new upgraded Securitrons. You could circumvent Benny's circumvention plan and take Benny out of that seat and put yourself there instead. And Yes Man is excellent. He's an excellent character who just uh, has to say yes to everything. Basically, he's just like painfully agreeable <laughs> um, to a fault to his own detriment. Well, that's an unusual approach. But I know it makes sense somehow if you're the one doing it. The problem is me. I can't get over how brave you were to destroy all those Securitrons at the fort. You know, it's just gonna make everything so much more... Uh, challenging! Yeah! 
challenging. And uh, the art here is fantastic. Uh, he's he's hiding a body under a rug, which I don't remember him doing anything like that in the story, or if even if he would be capable of doing that based on how he seems to act based on his programming. But the image of him like waving whilst he's just yanked this rug over the body is excellent, and I do love it even if it doesn't feel apt to the character. Let's look at what he does. Two and a white for a two-two legendary artifact creature robot. Tap. Target opponent gains control of Yes Man personal Securitron. When they do, you draw two cards and put a quest counter on Yes Man. Activate only during your turn. Wild Card, which is the name of Yes Man's quest in the story. When Yes Man leaves the battlefield, its owner creates a tapped 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token for each quest counter on it. So it's just, oh, it's so nearly there. It's really annoying of a card. Um, the passing it around thing feels semi-thematic. I suppose it feels thematic as... Benny sort of stole him from Mr. House, and then you, in turn, stole him from Benny. So passing Yes Man around the table like that feels semi-thematic. Or, or it also could feel like a good representation more of the player's actions on Yes Man's quest, where in um, when you say to Yes Man, actually me, thanks, I'm going to supplant Mr. House instead of Benny and gain control of New Vegas, he says, cool, go around all the different factions of of the Mojave and um, decide who you want in your new utopia or not. Or, you know, if they can help you out with the Battle of Hoover Dam or somewhere, which I don't think he says, but that's kind of also the secondary goal there. Regardless, you end up going and visiting all the different factions um, and deciding their fate, ultimately. Um, so, yes, man, sort of going to each of your opponents and benefiting them whilst secretly benefiting you, not secretly, but you know what I mean, benefiting you underhandedly is is very thematic to the character. This top ability, I feel like, does work really well, even if it sort of more feels like it's representing the player's actions on the quest rather than Yes Man. The wild card ability is just so irritating, because why is he making tapped one ones? That's not what he does. The soldier tokens look like the Minutemen from Fallout 4, so they have no relation to Yes Man or his New Vegas conquering quest. And the way that you gain control of New Vegas, like I said, with Yes Man, is through the fucking Securodrons that Mr. House makes, so why the fuck... Is Yes Man making 1-1 one, one white soldiers? He just doesn't do that. I don't get what this is in reference to. Would it have been, like, just make him cost a little bit more and make him make security trolls at the end and this would have been so on point for flavor. I, ah, it's so annoying. It's like this, like, the fact that it's like nearly on point with flavor, but just not quite, it's just so much more annoying than if it had, I don't know, been boring, really. Ah, oh, what a missed opportunity. Yes, man. It's just nearly there, but it's just not quite. Uh, I think that's, until we get to the really bad section, I think that's all the characters I had to talk about. Let's talk about bits. The other stuff. There's there's more specific categories, but this one's just called stuff. Um, so, yeah. Nuclear Fallout is a new board wipe uh, that also gives people rad counters. If you want to look up the mechanics of this, I'm not going to explain everything. Just go watch someone else's video. Uh, I'm not... It's a it's a fine board wipe that gives people rad counters. I'm more just highlighting it specifically for the art and the quote, which I'm assuming is from Fallout 1 or 2. I don't actually know. War. War never changes. The end of the world occurred pretty much as we had predicted. Too many humans, not enough space or resources to go around. The details are trivial and pointless. The reasons, as always... Purely human ones. I'm a huge fan of magic art that's more representative than uh, depicting a literal scene. Uh, obviously, we need a mix of both, but um, it's always nice to have a few. Oh, it's Jason Rebel. I didn't realize. Excellent artist, always fantastic. Imagery management uh, is fantastic. I actually really like this card, flavor wise, for representing the game well. <laughs> what am I saying? It's a real good representation of how the game feels. It's uh, uh, two mana white red instant with split second, so as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. Uh, for each aura and equipment you control, you may attach it to a, a creature you control, which is excellent because in all Bethesda games, I think, or at least in this one and other ones, you can pause the game at any time and open your inventory and there's no downside to you know, chaining your imagery around or whatever. So if you, if a giant super mutant uh, catches you off guard from around a corner and you're wielding a sniper rifle, you can open your inventory, um, select your bloody super sledge and smash him over the face. And obviously that happens all at instant speed because instant speed. <laughs> and, and obviously that happens all instantaneously because you're pausing the game while that happens. So I like that we have split second on this card and a few other cards actually to sort of represent that uh, pausing the game and it does a really good job of representing that. Big Horner Rancher isn't particularly exciting but um, I just I, I think it's a very another example of a simple mechanic 
um, translating flavor very well. Um, he's got tap and add an amount of green equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. It adds this um, benefit to the cultivation of creatures on your side. Uh, if you make your creatures bigger, you're going to get more mana, which is great for a farmer. So, cool. There's vaults. There's a few vaults. I'm kind of... I'm not sure how I feel about the vaults being used for... Or the vaults being the only things that got sagas in this set, because I think that would have been better as done as just sort of... Uh, quests overall, and maybe some of them could have been vaults, but you could have done a lot more interesting things with these than just the vaults, which are fine, but not really not my favourite parts of Fall Life. I know a lot of people love them the most, but I am not the biggest fan. I'm not really going to go through many of these. I think most of them are fine at representing the vaults they're at. The one I will linger on, though, is Vault 11, which is great. Uh, for those who don't know, I guess, with Fallout, vaults were where the population above survived before the bombs dropped. Although most of them were actually sadistic social experiments designed to fucking mess with the people post-war rather than actually just protect them. So for Vault 11, the bizarre drama that played out, um, basically all every year, the, it was every year, I think it was every year, but the, the residents of the Vault had to pick an overseer who would be killed. So every year one person was voted to die until there were only four people left, I believe. It was actually five. And each of those five. people agreed that they would not take part in the vote and object to it together. And upon doing this, the last five survivors were revealed to have passed the test and were finally freed from the vault, although I think they might have just committed suicide at that point. Actually, one of them killed the other four and then themselves. For each opponent, you create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token, and each player secretly votes for up to one creature, then those votes are revealed. If no creature got votes, each player draws a card. Otherwise, destroy each creature with the most votes or tied for most votes. Which is cool, representing the death of the person voted for, or everyone benefiting from no one voting. There's two um, battle siege cards referencing the siege cycle from Khans in this set. The first one being the Battle of Hoover Dam, which lets you win the uh, fight for the NCR of the Legion, which is great because that's something you can do in the thing. Uh, and the next one is the Struggle for Project Purity, which doesn't work quite as well because that fight doesn't actually have multiple outcomes like the Battle of Hoover Dam does. The Brotherhood's going to win every time. This isn't New Vegas where... The player's actions actually <laughs> affect the outcome of the story. So uh, maybe it just represents them controlling it at different points of time, but it's, it's strange that this is listed here next to the Battle of Hoover Dam as if they're comparable when they're not. There's a few perks that get cards, and most of them are done pretty well, I think. Grim Reaper's Sprint, that, yeah, they're all pretty good. None of them particularly stand out as bad or great. Sticky Fingers, and I just really like Elizabeth Perrow's character, who she painted across these four pieces, one of which I'll talk, to, talk about a bit. But I love this little story Elizabeth Piero created with the four pieces she provided. And how they're wearing a realistic bag for a character in a Fallout game, unlike all characters in Fallout games who have video game magic inventory the way they can fit in anything away. I like that this person's actually wearing a bag where it's like, actually, maybe you would be able to carry all the stuff that the player typically does. Boy flies discussing bug things that fly you in the game. I can't remember why I put this card down here. I guess because uh, if damage would be dealt to play, play flies one while it has a plus one, plus one counter on it, prevent that damage, remove that many plus one counters from it, then give each player a round count of each plus one counter removed this way, which blow flies explode uh, with a little AoE when you shoot them so you don't want them to be too near you when you do that, and that kind of represents that. Cool. The art for Wasteland Raider, I'm just not that much of a fan of it. They look fine. They're not, they're not too bad, but they're just not they're too uniform. Like, if these showed up in the game, I, I would almost expect it more from Fallout, because they'd be like, oh, look, it's the same character model twice. What a, what a classic video game issue, or whatever. But why do we have... Like, they, they're all just, like, so uniform. That's not how raiders work, usually. There's three raiders getting enough focus where we can see all of them in the middle of the card, and two of them have the same helmet, and three of them are wearing the same clothes. Is that... Does that sound like Fallout Raiders to you? Or just... Okay. Fair enough. It's not badly painted or anything. All of them individually look like good raiders, it's just collectively, they make the raiders look more uniform than they are. We're gonna move on to artifacts now, which I've, is another section. I, I, don't, I don't know what these sections are. The vending machine. Okay, I, I'm i gonna sound like the enemy of fun here. But I just, I find this vending machine card kind of irritating. And it's, it's I know it sounds silly, um, because it does seem like it's doing a good job of representing a vending machine mechanically. Pay one, tap, create a food token, and whenever you sacrifice a food, create a tapped treasure token. Implying that you can sort of take your bottle cap, feed it back into the vending machine and get another bottle, which isn't how it works in the game. And for some reason, that implication irritates me, even though this card is otherwise good flavor. I can see that, even if I find it annoying. Pitboy 3000, yes, it's pretty good mechanically. Uh, no, it's a great card mechanically. But in terms of translating the Pitboy mechanically, I think it's quite good. It's quite a nebulous thing to translate. They could do a bunch of different things. 
Um, giving it three relevant abilities that feel flavorful to things it does, I think that's fine. Um, not a smash hit, but great. The junk jet, uh, uh, yeah, mm, again, it's fine. It's a fun thing you can pick up in Fallout 3, probably Fallout 4 as well, I can't remember, but um, it lets you just stick junk in the junk jet and shoot it at people, like a really long-winded, less fun version of the gravity gun from Half-Life. And this thing, uh, when it ends the battlefield, you create a junk token. You can pay three and sacrifice another artifact and double. Equip creatures power until end of turn. I suppose it doesn't really feel like the flavor of you shooting junk, though, does it? Just doubling your creature's power. I mean, they're making it better, so that's them using the gun. But wouldn't it have been more fun to sacrifice artifacts and do damage to stuff? Fair enough. I mean, you do you. Silver Shroud costume, which uh, is a fun outfit you can wear to sort of pretend to be a 19... 30s-esque character while you're playing Fallout 4 on and certain missions let you if you're wearing the gear certain missions let you talk as the character which is a lot of fun and this thing is basically like a not quite as good whisper silk cloak although it just gives him flash I suppose but um, it gives the creature shroud until end of turn so you get flavor for using the same word as the thing bobbleheads are all pretty cool I think this is a pretty good job uh, I think they did a good job of bobbleheads there are seven of them one for each of the special traits they represent and they all are slightly over costed mana rocks where they just cost three and tap one mana of any color uh, and then they all have an ability which gets better the more bobbleheads you have which um, is cool because in the game you they don't really benefit you more the more you have, but you do want to collect them. So it's 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 you know at least adds benefit to collecting them. I'm not really sure how else you could have handled these that would have been better. So yeah, well done. The Nuka Nuke launcher, I just like what I I looked at this and I was like that's not what this is called right? That's called a, that's the Fat Man. I don't know why I don't know what this is. Um, so I looked it up and the Nuka Nuke launcher is the legendary variant of this weapon, which is a bit annoying because this isn't a legendary equipment, and also the Fat Man's just a way more iconic name than the Nuka Nuka Launcher, and this is just feels like almost like a mistake. I guess they didn't want to write Fat Man on a card, maybe? Is that conspiratorial? Maybe that's the reason. It just... It's just a bit shit. You just took away the cool name for a... This is like Nuka 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 Launcher. That's like the... the not-as-good name, you know? Like... We're naming the the nuke launcher. We can call it the nuke nuke launcher. We call it the Fat Man. Like the that second one is better. It's more flavorful, more thematic. It's just better. But it's just weird that like this is the one version of the Fat Man that we have. It's referencing the legendary one on a non-legendary card. I mean, it doesn't even really mechanically feel like the Fat Man that much. So yeah. let's look at some reprints next. I'm on reprints now. I'm not a huge fan of the Vault Boy reprints that we've got. They're fine if you're into it, but they keep showing up in Cockatrice, and I'm not a big fan. Having the Crucible of Worlds be the Garden of Eden creation kit, though, was very clever. Um, I haven't even played the original games, but I know what the Gek does, and it terraforms the dead land for you. So having that be a spell that lets you play lands at the graveyard, excellent flavor. Uh, on the same note, farewell with the most fucking shit-eating grin, the most, like, rage-inducing art you could possibly have on farewell is... Amazing, and I absolutely love it. This is a card that pisses off a lot of people. It was famous for Twitter discourse a few months ago. Um, so yeah, having the most rage-inducing art on the most rage-inducing card is a really good idea. I kind of love this. Oh, Ada as Solemn Simulacrum. That is incredibly... That was really well done. It's a robot that you find on the Automatron DLC, who, when you find her, all of her um, friends of the caravan that she was running with have all been gunned down. So uh, here they are. She's standing, looking up at the rain amongst all of her dead compatriots. And um, it's just an excellent choice for a Solemn Simulacrum reprint. One with the Machine shows Dima, who was a character from the Far Harbor DLC of Fallout 4. Probably the best character. One of the best characters in Fallout 4 and easily the best character in that DLC. Not much to speak about him here, except that it's cool to see him show up on this art. But that's from a reprint with uh, cool art and flavor. I quite like it. I like when these big commander staple cards get reprinted multiple times in these universes beyond sets with different art and they just i think those cards are really good fits for things that should get you know tons of universes beyond reprints it's stuff like blasphemous act where you can fit it into the property you desire there's already a warhammer and lord of the rings and doctor who version of this card excellent choice for reprinting into the ground path to exile i think is referencing the end of fallout 2 i want to say or maybe fallout 1 uh it might be fallout 1 it is fallout 1's ending Regardless, um, I'm aware that at the end of one of the original Fallouts, uh, after having left the vault to fix the water thing or get the gek, I can't remember which one it is. Regardless, once you return at the end of one of the first Fallouts to the vault, they decide that you are too different from everyone within the vault now and you must leave. Um, so that 
is referenced here on this new version of Path to Exile, I think. And it's pretty cool. Fraying Sanity, the reprint here, is referencing the promotional tie-in Penny Arcade comic to Fallout 3. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I kind of have distant memories of that existing. It's been many years since I looked at Penny Arcade. But um I remember that comic. It was about the evil plot for this vault being that there would only be one resident and just a box of puppets. So he just went insane in the vault with a bunch of puppets, basically. And I remember that comic, so I liked seeing the reference here. Brutus Ultimatum showing Caesar conquering the Mojave, which, uh, yep, cool, I guess. I think Brutus Ultimatum might have been a better choice for singularly destructive moments in the Fallout universe. Like, you using the weapon at the end of the Broken Steel DLC, or Helios, or something like that. It just, Caesar, as much as he's gonna conquer everything and impose his own will above everything, he's not, like, destroying, he's not raising it all to the ground. He's not, that's not his goal for the Mojave, and the way that Caesar has conquered things so far is by effectively incorporating all these smaller tribes into Caesar's Legion. So it just, to have Caesar be, um, it's obviously it's a really good reprint for the deck that is these colors, but it just, it's just not the best flavor fit in the world to have Caesar be on a card that's like fucking wipe everything out. Uh, there's actually a load of reprinted equipment that is varying degrees of okay. Swiffer Boots is now Rollerblades, which is kind of funny. You can find Rollerblades in New Vegas, but you can't wear them. So it's like a bit annoying. It's like, Maybe, I guess. Now I'm jealous of this character on the on the Swiffer Boots card that I can't become in Fallout. On a similar vein is Lightning Greaves, which are referencing like the long full legendary trousers you could find in Fallout 4. So it's kind of a specific reference, but fair enough. Also, I don't know why they're they're like the the, the good fall leggings when um why why do you want the leggings that make you fall better when they're supposed to be Lightning Greaves? But it's fine. Champion's Helm, just a diver's helmet, which I'm pretty sure you can get in Fallout 4, but who cares? I don't, I don't know. It's not even like one of the more iconic Fallout helmets. It's just like in one of the games. Bit of a bit of a weird choice. Champion's Helm is actually the Centurion helmet from Fallout 76. Not that I know what that is. I just couldn't see the plume in the art because it's the same color as the sky. Mechanist's hat for Skull Clamp. I suppose it's sort of like, again, it's just a helmet from Fallout 4 on a car that is technically a helmet in Magic, but doesn't really do anything associated with it. The Behemoth Sledge, which is now the Super Sledge, I guess. I guess they're both sledgehammers, so that's fine. I don't really know why this Super Sledge is gaining you life, but whatever. Fire Shrieker, yeah, just as a flamethrower, fine, fair enough. No real issues with that. And then the Bloodforged Battle Axe, which is just Grognax Axe. And like, it's just an axe. Like this, Bloodforged Battle Axe makes Copies of itself. That's the whole point. You make you, you keep getting new ones. That's not what Grognag's axe does, obviously. I don't know why it was this pick, really. It's just very strange. It's just an axe from Fallout. I guess that's the problem, is that you want to reprint Bloodforged Battle Axe, which has a very magic-y effect. And there's just really good options for that within Fallout. But then I would maybe question the choice of the reprint in that case. And you could maybe put something else there, as opposed to a card that doesn't really fit. Some lands. I'm not really going to talk that much about the lands. There's loads of, uh, there's honestly tons of really good land art, and most of it is really well chosen for flavor reasons. There's a new land cycle, which are all excellently flavorly chosen, uh, Sun Scorched Divide, referencing one of the good DLCs of Fallout, New Vegas, etc. Helios 1 lets you shoot things from the sky. Most of these are really good, uh, or at least fine. The, the land reprints, again, mostly are really good. Ir irrigated farmland showing the, um, can't remember exactly what it's called, but the Tarberry farm for Fallout 4, that's really cool. We have a bit of player modification with the water filters. Uh, really, really nice art. The one I just kind of really don't like is this jungle shrine, which has Sanctuary Hills on it. I just, I don't think anyone, nobody in the world would ever look at Sanctuary Hills and be like, oh yeah, a jungle shrine. It's just, I know it's the right colors, but you could have tried a bit harder here. This was a bad choice, which isn't true for most of these um, land arts, I'd say. This kind of sticks out. Um, a really particularly good one, though, is Treasure Treasure Vault as a reprint, showing the vault of the Sierra Madre, which is a casino that you heist in one of the DLCs for Fallout New Vegas. And um, one of the major themes of that DLC is that you have to leave behind this big stack of gold within the vault. So I like that here, Treasure Vault can make you a shitload of gold, but it requires a big investment on your part and also for you to sacrifice the vault, which is... Similar to how the, the vault was sealed after you used it, and um, with it, most of the gold. Okay, I think I've run out of things that I m liked or didn't despite, so we'll go through the bad ones. Okay, let's start at the beginning of my list. These ones are out of order, but whatever. Recon Craft Theta! It shows the 
crashed alien ship that you can find in the in the DC wasteland in Fallout 3. This one isn't crashed, even though it, maybe it's crashing in the art, but it's not crashed yet. It'll make you a zero, zero blue alien with a plus one count when it enters, and whenever it attacks, it'll proliferate across two to crew. But why is it flying around? You literally never see this thing. Well, no, I don't think you do see this thing flying. I'm pretty sure this is already crashed. At the point you start the game, maybe, maybe, maybe you see it crash. Regardless, um, there's no point at which you can see this flying. You find it in the ground. It's it's wrecked. The alien's dead. The cockpit smashed. It looks basically like how it does here, which I find incredibly confusing. And if I'm a bit insulting, I'm not trying to be. It's good art, obviously. It's well painted. It does look like whoever painted this just sort of painted the picture that's on the wiki. I didn't think much beyond that. Like, I guess the implication is. Like, it is in the process of crashing. It's, it's, it's like arcing down towards the, the, the earth, if you said to me. This is the moment before we saw, it looks like Project Purity is in the background as well. I think it's maybe crashing. Maybe that's, maybe this is like really well done in terms of positioning. I don't know. I can't remember. So this, yeah, maybe this is the art, maybe this is the moment right before it crashes, but it just, it looks like it's got the exact same damage that the crashed version of it had, including this like welt along the right side of it, which, looked like it was perfectly designed to line up with the map, uh, with the environment where it landed, so it's just such an odd choice. I, I guess the implication is it sustained some damage before the art, and now we're seeing it the moment before it crashed, and the, the damage it sustained is the same damage that you see in the thing. In which case, did it not sustain any damage from the impact itself, other than the smashed cockpit? It's just such an odd choice. I wouldn't I wouldn't have picked this as a vehicle to have actually be a moving vehicle, as opposed to like a bit of like a land or something, or an artifact that's stationary. And secondly, if I was going to do that, paint it not Fucked. Why does it look exactly like it does when it's crashed if it's going to be flying around and stuff? Just paint it as if it's not crashed. Like, it's really required me saying? If you're going to paint an alien spaceship that isn't crashed, maybe not have it be painted as if it's crashed. Is that so difficult? I just don't understand this complete weird flavor mishmash. Uh, Desdemona I'm bringing up next, who uh, is the leader of the railroad who want to rescue synths from the institute who make synths in Fallout 4. There's like a sort of a whole subplot, oh, maybe it's part of the major plot, whatever. There's a whole thing about this underground group of scientists making increasingly human-like robots. Uh, and the railroad has decided that now that they've gotten to the third generation of these robots that are basically process-wise indistinguishable from a human, and also they're making them look like humans, that the railroad's gonna step in and free some of these synths from their slavery, basically, of their existence and allow them to live as people in the wasteland. So they, they spent, the railroad spends their whole time rescuing synths from the Institute and saving synths or whatever and stuff and just being a reference to the the railroad of the civil rights era. So yeah, that's the whole deal is saving Sims, and you can see in the art here that testimony but again well painted, and she's holding a law appropriate railway rifle, which is their favorite weapon of choice, the the railroad. And behind her is a Gen two, I want to say maybe a Gen one synth. I think it's Gen two, looking like it's following her, and she's got this sort of like championing pose as if she's you know championing the synth behind her, and it's like that's the wrong type of synth. They don't care about the Gen 1s and 2s. Th those things are basically just like computers and you, you mow them down on mass, you see them all the time. Um, the Gen 3 synths, which is the ones that the railroad care about, look like people, basically. So I don't know why the fuck she's milling about with this bloody synth that has n just no relation to her whatsoever. Like, De she, Desdemona would just put a railway bolt through its head. That's her only... Like, it's like, in this art, if we say it's like, we take it literally, what would happen is you, you turn around and go, oh fuck, and just shoot in the head. That's what would happen the second after you saw this piece of art. Like, so, <laughs> so what? I don't understand this relation. There's even like conversations in the game about how the railroad do not do anything for the Gen 1 and 2 simps. They don't care about them. They don't regard them as people. Um, one of the synth characters in the game even takes some umbrage of this. Like, but we, the railroad don't fucking care about Gen 1s and 2s. And why the fuck did you paint a Gen 1 or 2? I think it's a Gen 2 with them as if that's the people they care for. And if you think I'm being, if you think I'm reading too much into this synth pose behind, uh, Desdemona, then check out the fucking art for Marshall Anthem. Here we have a bunch of railroad people. That's exactly, that's what who these people are. They're wearing railroad gear. They are the railroad lifting up a fucking Gen 2 synth again, whose leg is blown off. And again, this isn't someone that the railroad would care about at all. All the synths they look after look like fucking people. It just, this is such an obvious, easy fuck up. I don't understand how you fuck this up so badly. It, it takes like two minutes. Well, I don't know how, I, I guess you, maybe, maybe, maybe you do need to be a full up fan to understand this, but it just generally feels like the, the artists were provided, like, here's the railroad, they care about synths. Here's a synth, and 
that you just gave him the wrong image of a synth. I don't know who was in charge of creating the style guide for this set or the world guide or whatever it was, um, but you fucked up when you showed artists the wrong prompt for the synths, and it's really annoying. And this is going to be a case with lots of the cards in this section. All the glitters, a reprint showing a guy leaving the Lucky 38 with a bunch of ball caps, which, like, I guess... Uh, is this supposed to be the player character? Can you even gamble in the Lucky 38? Can you... That cannot be played. That cannot be played, right? You can't gamble. So it shows what well, looks like a raider, to be honest. Maybe it's supposed to be the player character, but I really don't think it is. Leaving the Lucky 38 with a bunch of ball caps, which just everything about this is just off. Sooner or later, the house always wins, which... I suppose it just doesn't make any sense. He's leaving the Lucky 38, which is the casino that Mr. House runs on the strip. And the player is the only person that's been allowed into the Lucky 38 for a long time, as everyone notes when you're allowed into the Lucky 38. And also another thing to know about the Lucky 38 is you can't fucking gamble in there. There's a bunch of machines and they don't fucking work. You literally cannot gamble in the Lucky 38. So <laughs> what is happening? Where has where he come from? How is the house winning? Why is he like... Leaving the Lucky 38 after having won, it, nothing about this card makes sense. It's just a complete flavor loss, complete mishmash of com nonsense. Have him leaving any of the other casinos, it would have made sense. Literally, you're having him, show, you're literally showing a character leaving the one casino that you can't gamble in or even go to. So, well, excellent, well done. Gunner Conscript, which is just such, I don't know what I'm looking at with this. It drives me insane. Uh, 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 uh. This card's called Gunner Conscript. Right, the Gunners were a militaristic faction of raidery type people in Fallout 4. They always wear green and combat armor, and they just generally look like a military force all the time. The weakest of their ranks are called the Conscripts, um, and you know what Conscripts are, they're just people that have been called up for- soldiers that have been called up for service. This art depicts what looks like a raider in this- in charge of this group of raiders that surround them. No one on this card looks like a, a gunner, they're not dressed like gunners at all, they're just like raiders. Uh, the uh, the armor they're fitting to this person looks inspired by raider power armor. They're barking orders, which isn't something you've ever seen a conscript do or would see a conscript do anywhere. All the abilities on the card are to do with adding more auras and equipment to it. It just... This isn't a gunner. It's like it's got the wrong name. Like, the card itself is showing you, like, a raider boss that gets bigger for outfitting. Like, the, the mechanics and the art are, like, marrying together to tell you this one story about this raider boss. And then it's just called... Gonna conscript, and I'm like, D no. It's like you named it Cheese Wheel or some random shit. It's just, I'm not looking at the thing you're saying this is. It's just not it. I just don't get why Madison Lee is one of the face commanders. Do you know, to be honest, the face commanders in general, I think, were, weren't the best choices. Caesar is a good choice. I guess people like dog meat, so I can see that, even if I don't really care personally. But the Mothman character from 76. Uh, I like Mothman as a. Outside of 76. The idea of Mothman is fun. I like moths because they're cute as far as insects go. But really, even the people playing, I don't know, maybe the people playing 76, maybe Mothman's like the, the most important character in that game. But just it, that, it seems like such a waste of opportunity to stick him on the front when there's so many other characters. Even the Master, I feel like would have been more iconic from the same deck. Madison Lee, what is she doing here? I don't... Given that there are a few really important characters that got missing, or like characters that, like real fan favorites like Joshua Graham that didn't end up in the decks at all, what the fuck is Madison Lee doing here? No one has an opinion on her. Like, you don't like her, you don't dislike her, you don't think about her, no one thinks about Madison Lee ever, she's a nothing, nothing character, I nothing her. It just... Why is she here? No one cares! She's just irrelevant! She's just like a no... She's just... The, the only emotion anyone's ever had about Madison Madison Lee was being like, Oh yeah, you were in Fallout 3! When she showed up in Fallout 4. That was it. A, a minor moment of recognition. Oh, oh, oh! That's the only thing. That's the only emotion anyone has ever derived from Madison Lee in any incarnation of her. What the fuck is she doing here? Why? Bestman 73... Um, which is a reprint. Bestman 73 is a reprint of Hornet Queen. Uh, Specimen 73 was a legendary... Cazador, which are these really scary, waspy insect things that stab the fucking shit out of you. They fly ultra fast in Fallout New Vegas and they stab you with poisonous stingers and they everyone underestimates them the first time they see them and they just get obliterated by horrible bugs that move a million miles an hour. Um, but that's what they do is they, they, they advance on you ultra quick and jab you. They jab you at melee range. What they don't do is shoot you with 
gunk from a distance, so I don't know what this art is representing. I even, like, I, it's been a while since I've played it. I remember Specimen 73 being the legendary one that you find in the Big Mountain DLC. And I just, I just wanted to check, so I watched that video again just to check after seeing this card. And it doesn't shoot crap at you, it advances on you and stabs you. I don't know why, what this art is referencing, I don't know why they're spitting green goo. That's like what blowflies, blowflies do, not what Cazadors do. Just odd and kind of wrong. The med kit, which uh, lets you, know, you pay one and you can choose one that hasn't been chosen. Stim pack, draw a card. Uh, fancy lads, snack cakes, create a food token, rad away, target player loses all rad counter, sacrifice the medkit. It's just a bit weird. I don't understand why the medkit doesn't sacrifice after you've used all the abilities and the, uh, just if you use the rad, the rad away, then you sacrifice the entire thing, which is very strange because it's like, what is the rad away holding it together? What? Secondly, why is a stim pack drawing you a card? What the fuck is that kind of flavor? This is literal trash. That is one out of ten flavor. Stim packs don't draw you cards. <laughs> I mean, obviously, but they don't do anything that's even re remotely like drawing cards. They will give you, they give you life. I'm sorry, it's it's a very clear translation from one thing to the other. A stim pack should fucking give you life. It just, that's what they do. They restore your health points, like you have in magic, and you could just do that. Um, if you wanted to have a draw a card, do one of the other drugs that's more like affecting the mind, like Jet or something, or um, Psycho, or whatever. I don't really care. I mean, there may not be great examples, but... um. Uh, what are the other ones that are, like, actually good for mind expansion? But Mentat, something like that. There's, there's lots of drugs you could have picked that were to do with increasing your... You know, affecting your mental state, not just, like, healing you. Why did you pick Stimpak for draw a card? Um, terrible flavour. Or awful flavour. Just take the fancy lad snack cakes, fine, whatever. Take it out. Don't make this thing make food. Just have it gain life through a Stimpak. Have it draw cards through a different drug. This was... a mistake. I'm sorry, but just having... It's just so irritating. Having a Stimpak draw you a card is, like... Destroying neurons in my brain. I hate this. It's fucking awful. <laughs> Sorry. I guess it's not that bad. But it is. It's terrible. Mechanized production. Uh, another reprint. It's showing some some smash nuka cutter crates being resided over by rats. But the flavor of the card's mechanics has always been about you benefiting from currently functioning production because the card produces things. So it's strange that the art and flavor of this one is all about looking back at the mechanized production of the past. Flavor's a bit off with this card. I would have, like, show the construction of Mr. House's robots like you have on some of the other cards. Like, that's a good example of mechanized production you could have had happening at the right time as opposed to just like, Hey guys, remember how there was loads of Nuka-Cola? Almost perfect. Uh, yeah, this is such an all over the place bit of nonsense. <laughs> it's referencing a perk from Fallout 3 that raised all of your special stats to 9. Um, so giving your creature base parent up as 9, 10 makes sense in that regard. It also gives you indestructible, which has nothing to do with the perk. And then the flavor text says, an incomplete suit of power armor is still a suit of power armor. Which like, what? That has nothing to do with the perk. But it does seem to have something to do with the art on the front, which at first glance you might say, that's not an incomplete set of power armor, that's got all the bits. And then if you look a little bit closer, you'll realize that, like, the the greaves or the legs are a bit rusty, the arms are a different color, and the, the head is a different color. Um, I'm re 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 informed by some of the people on Twitter that replied to me tweeting about this, that um, the different parts of the armor are different sets, which is a good detail on the artist's part. I think a better detail on the artist's part would have been to give the art some degree of asymmetricality, because it doesn't look incomplete, it doesn't read as incomplete right off the bat. Whereas if you'd made one of the arms a different color, or made one of the arms rusty, just have it be asymmetrical in some way, it would have read so much better. Um, as it stands, it's just a complete kind of flavor mishmash, head-scratching concept you can just about grasp if you um, know what to look for, I guess. I don't know, again, what is this card? What? What, what am I supposed to gleam off of this? What have I done equipping this to a creature? Have I given them power armor? Or that perk? It just, bleh. Inventory management is back on the list in the bad section. I know I really liked it, and I do initially, but the, uh, <laughs> the alternate art for inventory management doesn't show the inventory screen. That's just not the inventory screen. This style of card has been designed to make it look like the Pip-Boy screen um, from the game. Uh, your little in-game, in-universe UI menu. That has several screens, one of which is inventory. And that is not this screen! That's the condition screen where you fucking pop stim packs, etc. and apply them to your limbs to stop your limbs from being broken. As you can see, this character isn't the thing. It literally, it has condition and status highlighted on this thing. <laughs> yeah. 
was this so hard to get right? You didn't have to just fucking show the inventory screen. Oh my god. Like, firstly, I don't think showing the inventory screen is the best idea, personally, anyway. I think this is a bad idea. Secondly, um, if you're gonna show it, show the right fucking screen. Jesus Christ. Like, get the bare minimum right. Oh, wow. It's embarrassing. I actually hate this. Like... Maybe I love it because it's so bad. Maybe I do want this version of inventory management. Maybe I do want this version of inventory management because every time I look at it, it will make me cringe. Maybe there's some appeal to that. But, like, the only appeal in this in this version of this card is just how much it missed the mark. I can't stand this. I cannot stand this. Maybe I want it because of how much I can't stand it. Over Encumbered, uh, I just kind of hate this card. The art is really good by uh, Elizabeth Piera, and I really like this character that she's drawn across the four cards. I wish Over Encumbered was in any way good. It's two. One and a white for a aura that enchants your opponent. When it enters the battlefield, enchanted opponent creates a clue token, a food token, and a junk token. At the beginning of combat on enchanted opponent's turn, that player may pay one for each artifact they control. If they don't, creatures can't attack this combat. This card just is god-awful. It's such a bad card. Like, it's fine. It does a fine job mechanically representing the over-encumbered thing, although that's something you do to yourself rather than doing to your opponent, so it's a bit silly. But it's just such a fucking dog shit card. I hate this card. It's so conditional. It's, like, specific and conditional and just wank, and I don't think cards like this should be printed in these commander decks like they should have some utility this is like an immediate like throw it at the bin like when you when you receive the deck that over encumbered comes in like burn over encumbered <laughs> this is trash like fucking awful like it's like a reverse ghostly prison for one person provided they're playing lots of artifacts and you're also giving them a bunch of value like you give them three tokens to increase their artifact count, but they're all tokens they can just fucking sacrifice for value on the next turn, reducing the count. And you can't even play the spell on yourself to get the value. It's just like, fuck this spell. It's just useless. It's a useless wank spell. I know I said I wasn't going to evaluate cards on how good they are, but it's extra annoying because it's not bad flavor-wise. It's just wasted by being useless. I mean useless in Commander, I have no idea about other formats, and its potential performance there wouldn't get it a pass from me anyway because this card was made for a Commander deck. And then we have Heroic Reinforcements, which lets you make two white soldier creature tokens and turn creature control, get plus one, plus one, gain haste. Uh, it shows a bunch of vertebrates dropping troops off, and the flavor says, Assaulting the Institute has been set irrevocably in motion. All able-bodied field agents are already en route here. Desdemona, who's the leader of the railroad, as I discussed a minute ago. Except that the railroad don't use vertebrates at all. Like, that's exclusively done by the Brotherhood in Fallout 4. Uh, to be honest, these people, maybe these look Brotherhood-ish, but they're not super Brotherhoody. But regardless, the flavor is talking about assaulting the Institute. And you might be saying, oh, but I can get the, um... Railroad to send me vertebrates at the end of the game, which is a thing you can do at the very end of the game. After the Railroad has assaulted the Institute. So just this card means nothing. It's just, again, just another example of flavor all over the fucking place. Uh, Mysterious Stranger. Oh, it's one of the biggest letdowns in the set. What the fuck is this card doing? Ah, I'm annoyed by it. Two and two red for a three-two human rogue. It's got flash when it enters the battlefield for each graveyard with an instant or sorcery card in it. Exile target instant or sorcery card from that graveyard. If two or more cards are exiled this way, choose one of them at random and copy it. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. Which, like, is that the Mysterious Stranger? Is that what he does? Mysterious Stranger was a perk you could get, and occasionally while you were using vats, a mysterious stranger would show up and just obliterate the thing that you were killing, you know, or you were shooting at. So every now and then, some guy would show up and the music would go, would play like a cool little sting, and he would, he would shoot the guy for you. Um, show up in his hat and his trench coat, shoot with a revolver, you know, that was it. Um, this guy enters, casts spells at graveyards from random, so I suppose he could be casting a removal spell and shooting something, but it's just such a bizarre mishmash of flavor. Like, what? Why? Why not have him just... Have Flash enter, kill something, and then shuffle back into your library. That would have been so on point. That would have been exactly the flavor of the Mysterious Stranger. And I also can't stand the art. The Mysterious Stranger shows up and guns something down and then evaporates before you even have control over the game again. He doesn't show up and then hide behind a fucking tree. Like, what? What? Are you, what? He doesn't ever pose like this. He doesn't do anything like this at any point. The moment you see him, you hit the beginning of the musical stick and he goes, bang, 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 bang. And that's it. That's like all you see. And then he, and he disappears. So what is this? What is this scene depicting? The fuck is this about? The 
uh, alternate art for him is, is much better, um, i got to say. And I actually really like the alternate art for him. Um, I can't really tell what he's just killed, maybe a bunch of geckos, but... Um, at least he's surrounded by viscera, and um, he's like tipping his hat and spinning his revolver back into his belt. Much, much better than the regular art, which, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't depict the mysterious stranger. That's not him. That's not the mysterious stranger. That doesn't evoke the mysterious stranger for me at all. Not mechanically. Not flavorfully. Not in the art. Get away from me. That is another huge flavor fail for another iconic thing. I just, it's quite. It's getting a bit embarrassing. Instant. That's. Four, two black and two, four, uh, with split second. Choose any number of target creatures with equal toughness. Destroy the chosen creatures. Is, is that what Vats does? It lets you gun down creatures with equal stats? The, the fuck? This has nothing to do with Vats. Oh, look, split second, very on theme. Excellent. Vats says you pause the game, find targets, kill those targets with your gun. Vats gave you an act, you had a number of action points and you would allocate shots in vats with your action points and then now you spend your action points you press fire it will go bang 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 and you would fire off of those shots and they would land depending on the percentage hit chance you saw before you shot um so here vats just for some reason is choosing equal targets with equal toughness it just it's just not really how vats works my fr i showed my friend this and he immediately redesigned it on the spot and it infinitely felt more like vats wherein say you could destroy um creatures up to a certain value of toughness like um, just, you know seven or whatever and then you go bam you 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 Choose targets, like with VATs, with toughness or power or mana value or whatever you want, working as a stand-in for your AP and VATs, as opposed to just doing an effect that has nothing to do with VATs, other than killing stuff. It's just really annoying. I think that's all of the major stuff I was really annoyed about. I'm probably going to film some more bits and slot them in as we go. But, um, it's just, it's just a bit embarrassing. There's just these, all these tiny little issues and mistakes that just feel like this wasn't made by, like, a real fan of this series, or someone that really knew what was important about Fallout, but just by someone that, like, read the wiki, or just has a passing knowledge of the game. There's just no real slam dunks here. Like, some of them are really cool, but they're, compared to the other Universes Beyond products, which have been amongst the best that Wizards release each year, this is just fine. It's, like, pretty good. You did an okay job. Um, which, compared to those other ones, is gonna stick out. That's pretty fucking rubbish, if I'm honest. I will admit that I'm a bigger Fallout fan than I am a Warhammer or Doctor Who fan. I don't think I'd be able to point out these little misses about the other sets like I could with with this one. So um, if you're a, if you're a Doctor Who fan and you can see all these little like you know little annoying lore inconsistencies or stuff like that, then please let me know because I'm interested. I just didn't get that perception about any of the previous Universes Beyond products, and there have been a few of the Universe Beyond secret layers that have pissed people off and let them down. But those are nowhere near the scale of even the Commander decks, and with all the secret layers, the community's complaints weren't focused on the cards poorly translating their different IPs. Wizards mess up products for myriad reasons, you see, but they're often on point with the flavour of Universes Beyond, especially with the larger products. I didn't see Warhammer fans and Doctor Who fans saying, oh, you got this wrong. It usually seemed like the opposite was true, where it was like universally praised, and it felt like it was being made by someone with a deep understanding of these universes that they're working within. That just isn't true for this. It just really feels like someone read through the fucking wiki page and made a bunch of cards off of it. Part of the big hampering for this set, off the, right off the bat for me, was that we saw those Fallout cards at a very sim like close time to that small run of Jurassic Park cards that we got within Ixalan, the last Ixalan set. And the Jurassic Park cards had an easier job because it's a small collection of cards, but for almost all of them, they were amongst the most flavorful cards I've ever seen in Magic. They were just incredible designs. You had a flying dinosaur that gave creatures flying until end of turn, and then when they lost flying, target land dealt three damage to them, implying that it'd pick them up and drop them, or just, oh, or, um, or don't move, perfectly creating the idea of the entire board remaining still while the T-Rex passes by. It just, it was, like, full of these incredible card designs that made you feel the, the world of Jurassic Park within the game. And outside of maybe Curie and Three Dog, if I'm being generous, the Fallout cards just don't reach that standard. They don't even really come near it. The majority of them are pretty good, but too many of them are just fine at best. And a lot of the time, just really inconsistent and disappointing. It's fine. I'll even say it's, it's good overall. I think you did a good job just about overall. But, like, it's like a 6 out of 10, you know? It's not... It's, like, good. You're, you're a passing grade. And I just think that we deserve better, really. Um, you know, I think you deserve better. Don't, don't get mad at me, because uh, I'm, um, 
slagging off the decks you bought a four pack of already before they've come out. It's because I am a Fallout fan that I was able to recognize these issues with the Fallout product. I think <laughs> some of the opinions that annoy the fuck out of me on the internet more than anything else uh, are uncritical fans of things. If you're a fan of a franchise, then you have a better idea than other people of how to critically evaluate it, whether it's been done really well or whether it's not been done very well. And this is not a good translation of a lot of Fallout's mechanics and themes and characters. They, they can do better. There's not really a big thesis for the end of this video, except I'm just a bit annoyed and I need to point out these really annoying issues of the Fallout set. That's basically what this is doing. Is that the end? I don't think I'm to say. So yeah, I'm a bit annoyed. I'm disappointed. I wish this was better. I don't, I don't hate it. It's not terrible. By process of elimination, this is the worst Universes Beyond set to date, I'm afraid. Sorry, I wish it was different. Oh, and don't worry, it seems like Assassin's Creed is going to show up to steal the worst Universes Beyond crown pretty soon. I hope you liked March of the Machine Aftermath. Thanks for watching, everybody. Fallout times Magic the Gathering still cool. Like I said, I do think it's good overall. And it's still nice to just see Fallout things on Magic the Gathering cards, even when they're not super exciting. Look, my Steel Overseer looks like a Protectron now. Hooray. That's enough, right? Remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel and touch the bell and follow me on social media. And why not watch some of my older videos while you're here? We got ones about the Guildless of Ravnica. We got ones about how Sauron is dumb. And thank my patrons with me. Thank you, lovely patrons. I couldn't have done it without you. Or I could, but I'd be poorer. And if you want to become a patron, you can do that pretty easily by giving me money. Look at each beautifully constructed name of all my brass squire and parcel myriad patrons. Each is a delicate, special flower. And now the most myriad of my patrons deserving of the most admiration and respect. A huge thank you to all the mere jangling around in the battle sphere. Despite all that jangling, I can still read their names. And they are Jakob, Sebastian Rees, Storfeting, Marshall Mir, Eric Vaughan, Librarian of Leng, Stevo, Santiago Adia, Chonga, the Banished Mole King, Patrick Dane, and Mimeo. That's the end. Uh, I don't have anything else left. Sorry! <laughs>